guys know we're in Revelation chapter 8 and we're going to continue to go there. We have a couple of scriptures that we're going to be, uh, be talking about on today as we deal with this topic of the seven trumpets. And so I want to go to Revelation chapter 8. I want to kind of jump into it and then give our introduction as we uh, read uh, these couple of verses in Revelation chapter 8, verses 6 through 12. Uh, because this is where we'll be today, and I think uh, we need to read these verses to really get a, a picture of what God is saying here as we begin to break down these seven trumpets, these seven trumpets. And so let us all go to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, let's look at verse 6. And I'll start at verse 6. You guys follow along as I read. It says, Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there, fell, and there followed hell and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burnt up, and a third of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star from fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. And the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water, because it was made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Wow. wow. <laughs> Man, <laughs> that right there is absolutely terrifying if you're living on the planet at the time and you see all these things that are going on. And I know we're just reading it, and I, we don't get the great effect, but imagine the the inhabitants that will be on this planet and these things are taking place. You see why Jesus said in Luke that men's hearts will be failing them. People will be having heart attacks because of the things that are going on on the planet at this time. You're going to see absolutely uh, the whole universe beginning to disintegrate right before your eyes as it prepares for the return of Jesus Christ. And so we are, we're looking at these trumpet judgments. Now, you guys remember, we've come to the events, if you will, contained within the seventh seal scroll that the Lamb received from his Father. Here's what I want you guys to remember when you think about these trumpet judgments. This is what was inside the scroll. Remember, we have finished the seal judgments that started in Revelation chapter 6. And so now, what are we looking at? We're looking at the contents inside the seven seal scroll. Now the scroll is completely open. If you guys remember, on last week, what did we end with? The seventh seal was silence. Remember we talked about silence, and now we've seen why there was silence. Because now the scroll is open, and now we can see what has been hidden and through, but, uh, before the foundation of the world now is made known now it is laid to bear now God is revealing how he is going to take back his creation from the usurper Satan from the false kingdom of the beast from the false prophets and destroy all the ungodly now we're seeing it and you can imagine silence has fell upon heaven because we are seeing it the seven seals have finally been broken, so like we said, now it can be revealed. Remember the book of Revelation. What is the book of Revelation about? It's an unveiling. It's a revealing. So now the seven seal scroll, what's inside of it, can now be revealed to us, and John can now record it so we can know about it. Within the scroll contains the most horrific and cataclysmic judgments that have ever been unleashed on the earth 
are experienced by mankind. We're just reading a couple of it. Remember, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 tells us that this time or this seven-year period will be called a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. In other words, Daniel says it's going to be a time of trouble that has never since been since there was a nation. Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior, in Matthew 24, listen to what he says. He says, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. Jesus says there will be great tribulation. He said that time, Elder Charles, will be great tribulation, such as has never been. And it will never be another time period like that again. This is Jesus speaking, the creator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think it bears us to say we can read those verses and yawn and just say, oh, whatever. But guys, it's going to be absolutely horrific. Absolutely hor horrific. And the events of the seven trumpet trumpets, judgments, they describe to us that time. Remember. Let's, let's just think about what we're talking about. When we talked about the seal judgments, what were the seal judgments? Remember what we told you. Those were not actual events that were taking place. Remember? When you're talking about the seal, remember the first seal was open, a white horse. And the, those were not events. That was the character of the entire seven years. So the entire seven years will be full of deception. The entire seven years will be full of war. The entire seven years will be full of massive death and famine and economic evil and vengeance. You see, that's what the entire periods are. Now, we're going to learn about the events that will be causing all of these things. You get it? See, the seal judgments are the seals that were on the outside of the scroll. So now it gives us a flavor of what it's going to be like. Well, now we're going to read about the events that's going to cause all of the massive death. We're going to read about the events that's going to be called. We're going to see God bringing vengeance. We're going to see the events that will cause the economic upheaval. I mean, you just, did you just read all of this? You don't think some of that's going to cause economic destruction? Can you imagine if there are hail stones falling and, and a third of the earth is burnt up? Do you know how many insurance claims you're going to have? <laughs> Do you, can you imagine if you're talking about a third of people dying? Do you know how many uh, life insurance policies that are going to have to be paid out? <laughs> are you, got, you see, you have to think about what we're talking about. So you're seeing how all of the death all of the carnage can take place because now we're going to read about it in these seven trumpets and the seven bowls, okay? Now watch this, guys. I've entitled this message, The Seven Trumpets. I could have entitled it Catastrophism. Now I know you've never heard of that word before. I'm not going to say a raise of hands who have heard of the word Catastrophism. Well, geologically, you guys know what geology is, right? Mm -hmm. Geology is the study of the what? Of the earth, specifically the earth. Now remember, when you're talking about geology, you're talking about the earth. You're not necessarily talking about the cosmos. You're not talking about the universe. You're talking about the earth, where geologically, the events described in the first four trumpet judgments are what is called uh, catastrophic events. Y'all follow me? Those are catastrophic events. Now, catastrophism is the scientific theory that the Earth's geology has been largely and dramatically shaped by catastrophic worldwide events in the past. If you study geology, catastrophism is the theory that what has shaped our geology, what has shaped our world, how were the continents formed? How, why does the United States look like it looks? You follow what I mean? How did the Grand Canyon get here? How do we get these sedimentary deposits over here? How did the fossils get here? How, you see, 
Geology tries to answer that question. Well, one of the theories, Roscoe, is called catastrophism. That in history, in the past, there were catastrophic events that took place and where all of a sudden it formed all of these geological phenomena. Okay? You guys follow that? In other words, catastrophists believe that the Grand Canyon was not caused by a little bitty river over billions of years carving out a cavern in, 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 in Arizona. Or Utah, whatever. I know it goes over and say Arizona. You see? No. Here's what catastrophists say. That there was a massive flood. And in that massive flood... It carved right through the rock, and in a span of maybe a year or so, bam, you have a great chasm that takes place. You follow I me? Mean? That's catastrophism. And so, actually, the Bible supports that view. Now, watch this. I know, you know, you guys, you remember, you come to church, we come to church to learn something. Amen. Okay? So, let's look at this, guys. Catastrophism was largely, was the largely hell geological view of most scientists during the 17th and 18th century and to the rise of a new theory you ready for it here's a three dollar word called uniformitarianism okay. <laughs> y'all still with me okay so during the 18th century there was a new theory called uniformitarianism Coming from the word uniform, or uniformity. Now watch this. Uniformitarianism is also known as the doctrine of uniformity. It is the assumption, say assumption, assumption. that the present interprets the past, and that geological changes in the earth happen over a long, gradual, extended period of time. In other, in other words, a uniformist, what they believe is, no, there were no catastrophic events. There was just little bitty small events that happened over billions of years to produce the things the way we see them now. In other words, a uniformist, what are they trying to conform to? Just think for a minute. What theory would a uniformist try to bring their view into agreement with? Evolution. Evolution! Because what was also in the 18th century, what was also coming up in the 17th century, Darwinism, the theory of evolution was beginning to flourish. Okay. Remember, that was in the 19th century, but don't think that Darwin came up with it. Right, right, right. It was already, his grandfather was doing great research in the theories of evolution. And so because evolution was starting to take its stronghold in science, what happened was, catastrophism kind of went out the window and everybody adopted what is known as uniformitarianism. Now, a uniformist believes that things will continue to go on as they have in the past and that they'll slowly change over time. Believe it or not, most people are uniformists. We all believe that things will continue to go on as they have always been and pretty soon, things will change. It'll get better. We just have to make it through this problem. Okay? That's not what the Bible teaches. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Remember, I like 2 Peter chapter 3 because Peter deals with the uniformists. 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2. It says that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of our Lord and Savior through our apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Now, what will they be saying? They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, here you go. Nothing has changed. You guys have been whining about Jesus coming back. The apostle Paul thought he was coming back in his time. That was 2,000 years ago. As a matter of fact, what date are you setting for today? 
Will it be this year? Will it be next year? Give me another date. Because I'm telling you, all you Christians are always talking about things that this is going to happen. Christ is coming back. But guess what? Ain't nothing changed. The world has been like it is forever. We've been here 14.3 billion years. The sun has another billion years worth of energy. The moon will stay where it is. Everything will keep going on as, as it's always been. But look at what Peter says in verse 5. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water and by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Mm -hmm. What does he say to the uniformers? Here is what you are forgetting. The flood. Things did not just go on as they always have been. There was a massive event called the flood. And so for you to think that things are just going to continue to go on as they are, you're forgetting one fact. There have been major shifts and changes throughout the history of creation Amen. that God has caused. Are y'all following me here? A uniformitarianism, listen to this, that, that whole idea was birthed out from the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason. I would encourage any Christian, go study the Enlightenment. Be careful, but study the Enlightenment. It's known as the Age of Reason. It is when humanism began to take its foothold into culture. And now, watch this, Elder Charles, religion was moved to the background and now man could determine his own way by his own humanistic ideas. We don't need God because back before you had evolution, who was the only what was the only thing that could explain creation? The Bible. Mm -hmm. Nobody had a viable solution. And then comes evolution. Over billions and billions of years ago, there was a Big Bang Theory. And then all of a sudden, out of a single molecule, a single cell organism, it then grew into a multi-complex organism over billions of years. And finally, the slug became uh, uh, an organism. It crawled out of the sea. It became a bird. And it died again. And it fell in. It became a human. All of these different things. And man bought it hook, line, and sinker. But why did man buy it, Jimmy? Not because they believed that man bought it, because man was further removing himself away from the Bible. Are oh, y'all getting it? Amen. Amen. Please hear me, guys. You want to know something, guys? During that time, uniformitarianism took off because at that time, most scientists who believe in catastrophism ascribed these cataclysmic events, watch this, to divine acts of God. In other words, the catastrophes, here's what they said, Mom, that there were some catastrophic events that took place, and God did that. Mm -hmm. But as science was becoming led more godless mm -hmm. and more secular, guess what? We had to get out of this God idea. You get it? Even though, if people, even though well-known scientists have studied the ideas of the flood, and they see how the flood actually it's very provable, and it, it, the flood explains what we know as an ice age. Okay, an ice age didn't last for millions of years. Come on, wake up, people. Because if you have that amount of water, right. and it goes into a cold area like Russia, it's going to freeze up. That you know, ice age. But it's not going to last a million years. It's going to eventually melt. You see, science only proposes these large-scale numbers to satisfy evolution. And now evolutionists are coming out saying that even the 14.8 billion years is not enough time. Mm -hmm. So guess what science does? They don't go and do another theory. They just push the time back out a little bit. Oh, we were wrong. We weren't 14. They, how about 16 too? <laughs> no, guys. That's not science. Do y'all understand that? That's not science. What is science? You have a theory. And what do you do with that theory, Roscoe, after you have it? You test it. And if you test it and you can't prove that theory, what are you supposed to do with that theory? Discard it. 
How many of y'all know evolution cannot be proven? Nobody has seen anything evolve. Nobody. One of the longest living animals, believe it or not, are sea turtles. And guess what? They come into this world as a sea turtle, and some of them can live to be 125 years old, and they die as a sea turtle. But they'll just tell you, well, there's not enough time. If it was 125 billion years, the sea turtle would become a man. <laughs> Guys, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Because Genesis chapter 7, verse 11 says this. In the 600 year of Noah's life, all the fountains of the deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 19 of chapter 7 says, And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heavens were covered. Right. Now, if all the high mountains were covered, what does that mean? Was the flood regional, Roscoe, or was it global? You wonder how? Y'all are using common sense. Because if waters cover a mountain, are they just going to stay in a little area? Can you imagine, we say it was, it was a flood and it took place in Stone Mountain and it just covered Stone Mountain. It didn't hit Clarkston. It didn't hit Decatur. It didn't hit anything. Else. It just flooded over Stone Mountain. It doesn't make any sense. The water just not going to stay there. If the water gets high enough to cover Stone Mountain, this flood is absolutely catastrophic. Are you getting what I'm saying? Imagine what we're talking about. This flood was high enough to cover the highest peak, which would have been what? Mount Everest, which is known to be at 26 or 28,000 feet. Can you imagine the waters that high? Guys, that's a global flood. How many of y'all know that? Would you think that would characterize as a catastrophic event? Guys, this verse describes the massive cataclysmic event known as the deluge. And I like that word better. Because when you hear this flood thing, you know, you just think that it rained a little pitter pad, you know, like it rained yesterday. And then anybody with brain know that I don't care how hard it rains, you're not going to produce flooding like that in 40 days. But when you understand what the scripture talks about, the fountains of the deep broke up. What is that, Elder Charles? That's a massive earthquake. That's a massive earthquake where the subterranean water levels that are located in the middle earth, they begin to gush forth and blow up. And then whatever in the windows of heaven, that's water from the heavens. That's not water, that's not water from clouds. <laughs> That's water from heaven. And literally, when you look at the deluge, when you think about it, that, that's literally, boom, God just taking a cup full of water and turning it over. And the water comes down like a splat. <laughs> and not only is it splatting on the ground, it's coming up. So you got folks shooting up like geysers. I mean, this is absolutely catastrophic. So catastrophic that it tears up the continents and separates them. It causes the dinosaurs, where most of all of your dinosaurs' fossils, the dinosaurs are found with their necks back. Wow. And they said, well, why are they like that? Oh, that's because they were running. Because, they, you know, in, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula, when the media blew up, they were running. No, they said, well, if they blew up like that, they'd be incinerated. But how can we find these dinosaurs with their necks back? Because guess what? They're trying to breathe. Because they're dying. They're drowning. <laughs> And then not only that, they found all, every time when they find fossils, they find them in like a bed full of millions of animal fossils. Why? Because they all died in the flood. When they find these human remains, that they think, hey, they all died in an area. <laughs> and that lets you know, guys, that the flooding is true. How do you find fish fossils in the Arizona Grand Canyon Caves. Mm -hmm. How did the fish get there? Because they were flooding. There was massive flooding, guys. And we know, guys, watch this. I'm going to read this. this. These verses describe the massive and cataclysmic event known as the Deluge. Watch this. Which geologically reshaped the Earth's topography, ecology, and climatology. And this was all done in a matter of 40 days. 
not billions of years. God was able to do it in 40 days. Are y'all missing that? Not 40 billion years. 40 days. But we ought to not be surprised because God was able to create the entire universe in six days. And if you think that the flood was a catastrophic event, imagine if you were around here when the universe was being created. <laughs> Y'all do realize when God made the trees, it wasn't like little tree buds came out and they grew over time. Can you imagine this if you were walking on the planet and God said, let the, let the ground bring forth the tree, all of a sudden, boom, just trees, just, <laughs> they just shot up, man. I mean, just, I mean, you got all these animals. This was like, wow. Because it's God. Even if there was a Big Bang, if you was around, you couldn't survive it. <laughs> you see? So when we look at this, guys, we know that the six days are full of catastrophic events at the early part of creation performed by God. In the formation of the universe. Listen to this. From man's perspective, these catastrophic events, uh, 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 these are catastrophic events. From our perspective, you follow what I mean? From our perspective, they're catastrophic events. But from God's perspective, they are nothing more than the demonstration and manifestation of his power and glory in the seen invisible realm. God says, you want to know how powerful I am? What you think takes 4 billion years to do, I can do it in 40 days. What you think takes 4 billion years for you, for, for, for some continent to move off on the side, God says, I can do it in 40 days by doing this fool. Wow. I don't know if y'all get this. Even in God moving the tectonic plates around like that, <laughs> The protection of Noah on the water is all so beautiful, yes. but the life had to die. Mm -hmm. Can I say something? Because can you imagine being living while North America is just moving away? <laughs> right, right, right. Y'all don't get what I'm saying. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not like we could just stay in our house, Jimmy, until we get across the Atlantic. Right, right, right. <laughs> Guys, if, if you had people walking around at that time, they died. So what does God do? Well, they're going to die anyway because they're all, they're all sinful and they've all rebelled against me. I'm only going to save eight. So I'm going to kill off all of them, get the animals safely on and kill off the other animals that we don't need that the fallen angels came down here and created this whole mishmash of stuff. And then I'm going to just move everything around, spread everybody out. Because I already know what's going to happen at the, at the Tower of Babel. They're going to get crazy, so then they're going to want to do all this. So I'm going to get everything ready because guess what? God already wrote history. Well in advance. So y'all follow me here. Let me go with this, guys. Look at this. Go back to 2 Peter. Maybe you never left it. Look at verse 7. I want you to see this. Are you there? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. It says, But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and, when, and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Look at verse 12. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because what will happen on that day? In which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolve, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. What took God six days to create, he will uncreate it at the end of, at the end of history. Go study out those phrases of what it means that the elements will burn with fervent heat. God's going to set on fire this entire universe. <laughs> wow. The stars will burn. The planets will burn. Everything will be removed out of its place in order to renovate this whole entire universe for Jesus Christ. Are y'all here? Are y'all listening to them? God is the one who created it, and God is the one who can uncreate it. 
Guys, what we're reading about, the trumpet judgments during the tribulation cover seven years, uh, uh, covering seven years described to us another geological occurrence of catastrophism. God's going to rearrange the universe. Y'all know that's coming. God's going to rearrange the planet. And it's going to take seven years for God to do it. Mm -hmm. Imagine what that'll do for science. Wow. <laughs> you just said it. Okay. Uh, look, look at this, guys. Y'all still with me? Please stick with me. Listen what the book of Revelation. I'm just give you a snippet. The book of Revelation is filled with geological catas catastrophic events. During a relatively short period of time, seven years, mom, to be exact, here's what the scripture says in Revelation. Every mountain and island will be removed out of its place. Wow. Mm. According to a uniformist, that would take billions of years. God says, no, when Jesus touches the ground, every mountain is going to be removed and every island is going to be removed. All right. Okay? Look at this. It also talks about the waters of the world will be turned to blood or made poisonous, killing a third of the sea life. That's a geological catastrophe. The waters. Do you know 70% of the planet is made up of water? If a third of them are turned bloody and poisonous and then the sea creatures die, that's a geological nightmare. It also talks about a third of the earth and a third of the trees being burnt up. That's a geological catastrophe. Also, we're going to read about it today. All the green grass of the earth will be burnt up. How many of y'all love your yard? <laughs> God said, all the green grass, Roscoe, will be burnt up. Mm. All that work you put in, Elder Child, you're, you're a deacon eyes. Y'all I mean, keep a pretty yard. And then God, then one day, <laughs> Oh, and by the way, it's also a scripture that talks about the great river Euphrates will dry up. Well, now CNN is going to report that to Fox News. Guys, I don't believe what we're saying. The river Euphrates that runs through Iraq all the way going to the east, it is completely drying up. There's no water. Guys, these are geological catastrophes that are going to take place over a seven-year period. Wow. <laughs> I like what John MacArthur says. Here's what he says, and I quote, If you think that man is destroying the earth, Wait till you see what God is going to do to it in seven years. <laughs> wow. So the question is, guys, that often comes up when we get into these trumpet judgments and we're about to get into them. Well, then why is God punishing the earth? Doesn't it seem like God's punishing the earth? What did the earth do, Roscoe? I mean, what, I mean, you know, why is he unleashing judgment on the planet? It looks like man should be the one. No, that's not that. I want you to hear this. God is not punishing the earth. The earth was made subject to futility by the fall of man. Go to Romans chapter 8. Everybody go to Romans chapter 8. I want you to see this. Because we have to deal with this with our environmentalists. Our Peter people. They say Peter. People eating tasty animals. Uh, that's not what it means. <laughs> look at this Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 look at verse 19 right it says for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God for the creation was made subject to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What does it talk about? That the creation itself is groaning to be set free from its bondage and corruption. I like what the King James says. It talks about decay. The, 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 the creation is waiting to be set free from that. Look at that word futility. The word futility in the Greek literally means aimlessness, purposelessness, ineffectiveness, 
unreality. Because of the fall of man, creation lost its purpose and became nothing more than an expression of fallen man and a place to express his sin and rebellion to God. In other words, God created the creation for a purpose, but because of the fall of man, creation lost that purpose. So this planet that we're living in now, the creation that we see now, it's purposelessness. It's just purposeless. It has no purpose, because God, what we're seeing, God did not create it to be like this. Mm. Now this creation has become an expression of fallen man's heart and it has become the place where we do all our devilish sins against God. Adam shows us that in the very beginning because when Adam sins against God, what does he do? He hides amongst the trees. Y'all missed that. He takes creation and he turns it against its purpose. Do you think God created a cheat tree so you can hide from him? Right. That's the purpose of That's not the purpose of why he makes the tree. So at so you can see this verse, creation became purposeless. Uh -uh. And this messes up environmental people. Because I know we want to save the spotted owls. I know we don't want to see the caribou damaged in Alaska. That's why we don't want to drill. I, I, I know we, we, we want to save the cuttlefish. Guys, a third of those fish going to die anyway. And here's the deal, man. <laughs> because God says that this planet has lost its purpose. And furthermore, watch this. Y'all still with me? Look at Romans chapter 1. Let me show you another thing with the creation. Excuse me. Romans chapter 1. Turn that right quick. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 21. Let me know when y'all get that. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. Hurry up. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. It says, For although Lindsay they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images of resembling mortal man, birds, and animals, and creeping things, because, verse 25, jump down to verse 25, because they, re they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served, what? The creature, rather than the creator, who is blessed forevermore. Notice that man began to worship creation right, 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 right. over the creator. Listen to this, guys. From protecting the rights of goldfish to establishing an entire day to worship the earth called Earth Day, man has always sought to worship and serve the creation over the creator. I looked it up. Do you know that there are common laws that protect the right of goldfish? You cannot give a goldfish as a prize anymore because goldfish are easily stressed. What? And they die very easily. Even as you change them and clean the water of the tank out, they can be stressed and put under a lot of stress and they die. Or if you release them into the water, they can grow to be two feet. And so because the goldfish are so stressed, we don't want to give them out as prizes to little kids anymore. We need to protect these precious animals while we kill over a million babies every year. Mm. Oh, it gets even more ridiculous, Jimmy. Listen to this. At Union Theological Seminary in New York, the students held a, surfeit, a service in which they placed numerous plants before them and proceeded to repent and make confessions of sins that they had committed against the plants. Oh. Oh, my. Yeah, a tweet from September 17, 2019. Listen to what it said. Today in chapel, we confess to plants. Together we held our grief, joy, regret, hope, guilt, and sorrow in prayer, offering to them offering to them to beings, the plants are beings, 
who sustain us, but whose gift we often fail to honor. Are you kidding me, guys? So now the plants sustain us? I know plants give us oxygen, but it's through God. Ironically, guys, the same ranked liberal seminaries president tweeted this in July in support of abortion and stated that the Bible talks about the Old Testament priests assisting women in their abortions. She says this in Numbers chapter 5. You read Numbers chapter 5 and see if you find anything about abortion. In Numbers chapter 5, you want to know what you read about? Numbers chapter 5 is about a husband catching, who doesn't catch his wife in adultery, but he believes she may have committed adultery. And he doesn't know if she's done it or not. And he takes her to the priest. And then the priest performs a ritual on her to see if she's clean or unclean. But you want to know what this lady says? No, no, no. That was the priest helping the woman with her abortion. As a matter of fact, she tweeted this. In Jesus' time, the women used all sorts of means as they have throughout history to deal with unwanted pregnancies. Wow. Guys, it's ridiculous. Let's confess the plants <laughs> while we kill life. Mm. But, but you know what? That's what liberalism does. Mm. Liberalism is absolutely ridiculous because it has you protecting things. You know, we could go back, everybody remembers certain cases where, you know, not, not, not to get in way, you remember the story, the whole thing with the Michael Vick and the dogs. Yes. Two years in prison. I mean, the man can't even live his life. For killing a bunch of vicious animals. But yet still, if a man runs over somebody, with man, it could be manslaughter. You know, he get manslaughter a little bit. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll give him time served. Guys, can you imagine the hypocrisy of our life? We have more laws on the books, and I Google this. We have more laws on the books for the planet and, and animals than we do for humans. Gaia, which is the Greek goddess of the earth. Mm. We also know it as Mother Earth. Mm. Has become a form of idolatry for the world as there are more laws created for the animals and the planets than they are for the unborn. The Gaia hypothesis or the Gaia principle is a scientific principle that the earth is one big living organism that maintains and perpetuates the conditions for life on the planet. In other words, scientists believe that, that the Gaia hypothesis is that the Earth is one big living organism. This is Avatar. This is Iowa. And we're all connected. You know, everybody's connected. Imagine during the tribulation, what will the pantheists do as God is laying waste to Earth? Oh guys, let me say it again, guys. Creation doesn't sustain our life. Mm. God sustains our life. Mm. Y'all follow me here. Mm -hmm. Don't get it twisted. Creation is a secondary cause. Yeah. Mm. The primary cause is God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says, All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. Christ holds all things together. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, He upholds the universe by the word of His power. This universe is held together by God. Amen. Amen. But false religions are filled with the worship of the creation while willfully rejecting the Creator. As a matter of fact, man has become obsessed with saving the planet over saving his soul. All right. Over in India, it's illegal to kill cows yeah. because cows are sacred. Yeah. To the point where men are willing to go and put cow urine on them in the mornings to bless their lives. Yeah. In Egypt, in ancient Egyptian culture, snakes were very, very venerated and held as gods. You can see how Egypt, for all of the black people that want to get back to our Egyptian paganism, then here it is, God. Here's what the Egyptians did. They created their humans with, with animal faces. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
And you got black folk that want to get back to our roots. What, get back to our roots of paganism and idolatry? Get back to our roots of hell worship? No, I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to worship some human being with the body of an eagle, a head of a, of a fish, and a body like a lion. I mean, what is that? Let's get back to our true roots, Roscoe. No, that's not. That's rebelling against God. Let's get back to hell. No. Well, guys, the trumpet judgments are direct. Listen to this. The trumpet judgments are a direct judgment against man and his worship of the earth. Mm. Got to get it. When the, why is the earth being there? Because God is like, okay, you guys have made an idol out of this. I'm going to show you what's going to happen. And we know God does this because if you study the trumpet judgments out, study the Egyptian plagues. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Whatever you make as an idol, God will turn that thing against you. Right. He said, wow. now tell the idol to save you. Wow. If you make a person your idol, that person will disappoint you so bad. Right. All right. Will have your whole life fall apart. Yeah. All right. You won't know what to do with yourself. And then God says, but I thought he was your God. Go pray to him. All right. No, he's not your God. He's a sinner. Or she's a mm. sinner. I'm God. Oh, 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 you want to make your job your God? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll cause a virus to take place. Mm. And I'll, I, I, I'll get you out of there. Oh, you want to make yourself a god? How about this sickness? Do something with that. Right. Amen. All right. God has emphatically said, "Is the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before Me." You know, God hates idolatry, and guess what? Man has made an absolute idol of this earth. We've made an idol out of our cars, our houses. For some some Christians, their house is their idol. For some men, man, our hobbies are our idols. Women, idols. We, we all have idols. And the biggest idol is the picture area in our homes called the family pictures. Because we're our own idols. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, okay. That's real. Yes, man, that's right. <laughs> we're an idolatrous nation, an idolatrous world. And God says, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do to your world. Earth Day won't be the same during the tribulation. Huh. I wonder when Union Seminary will be praying to the plants then as God burns up a third of them. Mm. Let's look at it right quick, guys. It's not going to look at this. Revelation chapter 6. Because the reason the reason why I spent some time on that first part is because the judgments are straightforward. Right. I mean, you need a theologian to confuse you with them. I mean, they're, they're straightforward. A third of the trees are burning. Well, what's that, Pastor Man? A third of the trees are burning. What can you even tell you? They call them fine and bad. I mean, they, what, what do you mean? But you have to get the background of this. Because in Revelation chapter 8, verse 6, look at what it says. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. I like that. I like that, Nancy. The seven angels who had the seven trumpets. I, you know, this is my own picture. I can just picture maybe the angels were sitting down, Roscoe. Now the scroll is over and they stand up. Come on, get up, Michael. Get up, man. Get ready. You know, they get to sell. You know how, how, how the band does. You know, you get your front boom, boom, boom. Make sure you got your note right. And then they're ready to go. They got their trumpets in their head. They ready to blow. They're waiting on the command of the Lamb. Guys, because you remember, these seven high-ranking angels are often called what? The presence angels. Remember, because it tells us in verse 2 that they stand before God. We also know that Gabriel is one of these angels because in Luke chapter 1 verse 19, remember when Gabriel gets upset with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, what does he tell him? I am Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God, you idiot. He didn't have the idiot part. But see, Zechariah didn't want to believe what Gabriel was saying. And Gabriel got a little testy. And he said, man, you know what? I'm Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, and I came to give you these great titles, and you're going to ask me all these questions. Now, I'm about to go to a little girl, and I'm about to tell her she's about to have a baby, and she's never had sex, and she ain't going to argue with me. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's John's version. <laughs> but you're going to argue with me over having a son right. at your old age. Fool, what about Abraham? Right. What I'm about to tell her is even more ridiculous. 
ridiculous. No, Gabriel stands in the presence of God. He's he's a presence presence angel, and like we said, for you want to go deeper in this book of Enoch, be careful though. In chapter thirty, that gives us the name of these angels: mm-hmm. Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, Sacriel, Requiel, Remiel. All of these; those are the names that he gives. You can take that for what it's worth. <laughs> you know, the seven trumpets. They are preparing to blow, guys. I don't want you to get a picture. This isn't a musical selection they're getting ready to do. These are divine judgments. Trumpets always stand for divine judgments. Guys, they're not about to play for heaven. This isn't the beginning of praise and worship, guys. This this is not a performance. This is judgment. Because the word prepared here in the Greek, I like this and I looked this up. The word prepared there in the Greek means to make ready. And furthermore, listen to this, Jimmy. It is written in the aorist indicative active. Now, you may not know what that means, but I'll tell you what it means. That means that it is written describing an event, Raymond, that happened in the past. Here's the amazing part. When the Greeks wanted to write a future event, Roscoe, with the certainty that it was going to come to pass, they would use the aorist tense. To show you that I'm telling you this is going to come to pass so much that it already happened. Mm. Wow. You get it? Mm-hmm. These seven angels blowing this trumpet, it is written in a tense that says, this is sure to happen. Mm-hmm. You better bet your bottom dollar. These angels will sound, they will blow these trumpets, and these judgments will take place. This is not hypothetical. This is not maybe. This is going to happen. That's exactly what it means, guys. The understanding is that John is not describing allegory. He's not describing symbolism here. He's not using poetic words, but he is describing what he is seeing with his eyes. These are events. Furthermore, these first four trumpet judgments can be read when you follow the ten plagues. And nobody will say the ten plagues of Egypt were symbolic. They happen. They happen. So look at the first trumpet right quick. Revelation chapter 8, 7. It says, And the first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burnt up, and a third of the trees were burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Notice how it starts off. It starts off with a dandy. Notice that God didn't get you ready. He doesn't tell the first age, let's start small. Let's start with a little nose, we'll wrap it up until we get to the big stuff. No, let's start. <laughs> we started with straight up devastation. Look at this. Write down Exodus chapter 9. If you want some description, some more description about this judgment, listen to this in Exodus chapter 9. This follows the pattern of the seventh plague of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 9, verse 22, it says, Stretch, this is, this is God, stretch out your hand towards heaven. He's talking to Moses, so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt. So when we read about this, this judgment in Egypt, we can get a feel of what it'll be like. And it says, Stretch out your hand so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast, and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff towards heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire rain down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very heavy hail, such has never been in all the land of Egypt since it was a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail? <laughs> See, that's another proof that God does not judge the righteous right. with the wicked. That's right. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's right. And it's also proof to show you that God is not indiscriminate with his judgments. He knows exactly who he's hitting. This is sovereign judgment. This isn't wild judgment. This isn't I'm getting upset and Nancy getting upset and, and we just throwing hell everywhere. You know, because we're just mad. 
You know how you do when you get mad, you throw, just throw stuff, you know, flip the table over, throw your clothes all around. Man, you don't care who you hit. It's not, that's not God, though. God doesn't bring judgment like that. This isn't some angry deity that's just uh, lost his mind and now he's just raining down hell hitting anybody. No, this is a Pacific. Think about it. How Pacific was this judgment? In, in Egypt, it only hit Egypt. That's deep. And it didn't hit Goshen. Can you imagine that? Mm, yeah. So you walk outside, you go down a little bit, you know, down, down a couple of blocks to Egypt. My God, man, it's tore up in your mouth. Then don't get into the hell. I ain't getting nothing. I didn't know he did anything, man. I slept like a baby last night. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, the hell and fire being mixed with blood. What does that mean, Pastor? How is that blood mixing that? You got to read it in the Greek, guys. It means that the hell and fire became mixed with blood. How did it become mixed with blood? Due to the death and carnage caused by the damage in hell. We read in Egypt, guys, when the hell fell down, what do you think? It just peed a plank to the ground? No. It killed beasts. It killed men. It killed and destroyed the trees. Also, notice that in that verse, it says that the hell and fire were thrown to the earth. This is probably an allusion back to verse 5. Remember in verse 5 that the angel at the altar took the censer and filled it with fire, Jimmy, and what did he do? He then threw it on the earth. This lets us know, guys, that this hell and fire is not a meteor, meteor, what is it? M meteor, how do you say that word? That's always a tough one. Meteorology. Meteorology. Yeah, it, this isn't some weather. This is divine judgment. This isn't a chance of hell on Tuesday. The weatherman is not going to be able to predict this. Carrie Minton is not going to get this right. Here's the deal, guys. Why? Because this isn't a weather thing that's going on. This is a divine judgment. And notice the results of this judgment, guys. What? A third of the earth and trees will be burnt up. Let that just sit there. Because, guys, this isn't regional. This is global devastation. As the earth and the trees burn from the rain of fire from the hail pummeling the earth. As a matter of fact, the verb burnt up in the Greek, it actually means to be totally and entirely consumed. Can you imagine if a third of the trees and the earth was burnt up? We, we look at the pictures, pictures of California. Can you imagine a third of the earth being burnt up and a third of the trees? Mom, what would that do? How about oxygen levels? Oxygen, yeah. For people who already suffer with asthma and, and breathing problems. Imagine you still got the, the virus and the other viruses going on at that time. Now, this will be devastating. This will be devastating. And then look at that, all the green, that, that one gets you. I, when I was looking at that one up, you, you have a lot of debate on that one. All the green grass was entirely burnt up. And literally, here's the best way to look at it in the Greek. This is all the grass that was green at the time of, of the judgment. Because, you know, all over the world, grass isn't green at the same time. Right, that's right. That's right. Now, do you get that? Right. But can you imagine that? All the grass, all the, guys, I want you to get the picture that's what makes the earth beautiful, the greenery. Right. Can you imagine going through a scorched, mm. smoky, hazy-looking, nasty, burnt-up earth? Mm. I, oh. I mean, you, you get it when you just go to the private. You know, I don't want to say nothing about the private. You know, they, they ain't got no grass. Okay, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> and you're like, man, it feels so rough over here. Right. Yeah. Come on, man. Keep a house with no grass. That's right. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, man. You know, cut, Deacon Isaac got his grass looking good in his two houses over there, man. That man ain't done know what his grass is all burnt up looking and nasty. You want to go say something to him, man? Get something with your yard. You're messing up the neighborhood. But can you imagine having a third of all and all the green grass burnt up? Guys, I don't, this is going to be an ugly planet. God says, no, go ahead, go ahead, worship Gaia. She's beautiful. 
No, guys, God is in sovereign control. That's the first judgment. Look at this. Look at the second judgment right quick. The second trumpet in verse 8. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain. I like when John didn't know what he saw. He said something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Notice that John said it was something like a great mountain. I remember what I told you. How do you interpret Revelation? You ter interpret it literally. Until the text, what does what tells you that it's not literal. Y'all get it? So what are we saying here? John tells you it was something like a great mountain. He didn't say it was a great mountain. He don't know what it was. But here's one thing we do know, guys. He it wasn't some type of celestial body because he actually used the Greek word for mountain. He that like there's a different word for meteor and asteroid. He doesn't use that word here. He uses the Greek word. It literally means a earth mountain. And so when I was looking it up, guys, here's what this is. This is a massive volcanic eruption that literally explodes and propels an entire mountain. Look at this, guys. Into the air that then lands in the sea, killing the third of the creatures and causing a massive tsunami that would kill and destroy a third of the ships. And if you don't believe it, go look at video clips of simulations of volcanic eruptions. When a volcano explodes, I'm talking about where they have a map. I'm not talking about where it oozes out. I'm talking about where it just boom. You guys remember, what was that crazy movie they had, uh, 2012? When, uh, oh, when, when they when the blew up and chunks of mountain were flowing out. That's literally what this looks like. When this thing blows up, literally, you can take the top of the mountain, it'll blow up. And can you imagine that, a volcanic eruption? This, this could be Mount St. Helens. Yeah. Mm. Are y'all hearing me, guys? This could be one of these great mountains that blows up. It could be a, a mountainous region in, 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 in Hawaii because it hasn't hit the water. Right. Right. So it's only a third. It didn't say all of them. It's a third. Japan, Japan exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's maybe it falls into the Pacific. Right. Maybe it hits the Atlantic, but it kills a third of the fish, mm -hmm. and it causes a massive tsunami. Can you imagine something that big hitting the water? It's going to cause a great tsunami to take place. And if there are ships out there, if you sailing out there, you you, you on the carnival paradise, and you enjoying yourself <laughs> on the Lido deck. Oh, good luck for that. Guys, when it says that the sea became blood, it's talking about the carnage produced in the sea from all the dead creatures. Or it could be from the effects of the catastrophic volcano that fills the sea with sulfuric acid and a reddish light colored ash. Wow. Are y'all seeing this? Think about the seals. If you have a depth of a third of the sea creatures, what, is that, what industry that's going to affect? Seafood. So that's going to that's lead to famine. If you have a destruction of a third of the ships, what is that going to affect? Economy. Trade. Trade. Import, export. Right. Fuel. Are y'all hearing me? <laughs> Look at the third one as we wrap it up. Look at the third trumpet. Verse 10, and the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star from heaven blazing like a torch, and it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. And the name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it was made bitter. Notice that this great star that fell from heaven like a burning torch is the Greek word aster. It is where we get the English word asteroid from. Literally, guys, this is a massive asteroid that falls from heaven, watch this, and then burns up as it enters the Earth's atmosphere, breaking into deadlier, smaller fragments that then hit the fresh springs and the rivers. Wow. Wow. But what about the name he gave it? We shouldn't be surprised about that because Psalms 147 says that he determines the numbers of the stars and he gives all the stars their names. I would think God knows the name which one he wants to pick. Not just random. He just, hey, warm work, come here. This is God. 
Because the wormwood, literally in the Greek, that word there means poisonous. That's why it says the waters became wormwood. Oh, okay. They become poisonous. These poisonous fragments of the asteroid fall into the fresh waters and corrupt the drinking water and kill millions across the planet. Still want to be here? Fresh springs, fresh rivers, poisonous. That'll kill a lot of fish life as well. Y'all hey, hear me today? This is, this is, I, I picture God saying, okay, worship the earth. Tell the fish God to stop it. Look at the fourth trumpet. Verse 12. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and the third of the sun was struck, and the third of the moon, and the third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining. Likewise, a third of the night. Wow. Mm. Guys, we understand this. Some people know it as sunspots. But talk about things that are so massive, where all of a sudden, a third of the sun is affected. Somebody says, well, he said a third of the moon. Well, if a third of the sun is affected, what would that do to the moon? Right, 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 right. A third of the moon would be affected. Y'all follow me here? Mm -hmm. And then look at all this, a third of the stars. Wow. This is a complete rearrangement of the universe, guys. So, so picture this. I want y'all to get the scene, man. Because, you, you, you know, you, you didn't want to wanted to play Christian. So you're left behind. And you're here. Imagine what the world is looking like. Imagine going outside, though, Charles. What, what happened to the beautiful blue sky, the beautiful day? Now it's this, it's this old murky, nasty-looking, never bright enough earth. And you got men who still won't repent. That's pretty bad, isn't it, Roscoe? Let's close. Look at verse 13. This is what this is what shocks you about Revelation. Look at verse. Are you at verse thirteen? Everybody at verse thirteen. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, saying, "This, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth, as the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow." Mm. Notice that we were able to go through those first four trumpets through 6 through 13. The last three takes over 55 verses to explain. Ooh. Yep. Wow. That's going to run through chapter 9 all the way to chapter 10 when we describe these last three angels. Because the last three angels, when they blow, literally, Lindsay, it unleashes hell on earth. Mm. Because the fifth angel, it says he has the key to the bottom of this pit. Mm. Oh, and he wow. opens it up and it belches out demonic spirits. Yeah. And another angel has these, these locusts like scorpions. And these, another one is a 200 army of, oh my God, wait. You thought that was bad that we just read about. If you got an eagle flying over, okay, just the fact the eagle saying something, that's enough to get me attention. But you got an eagle, you know, I'm picturing, maybe he just said, ah, ah, hold on, what he said, man, you know. But here's the deal, he telling the inhabitants of earth, whoa, whoa, whoa. He says, man, whoa to the inhabitants of earth, for you got three more angels that's getting ready to blow. Watch this, you haven't even, we haven't even done the, the, the bold judgments yet. Oh, wow. The only other time the angel does that is when Satan is thrown out of the second heaven and the angel says, woe, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth for the devil has come down to you knowing he has a short time and guess what, he's full of wrath. So guys, here's the deal, man. Catastrophism. That's the word you learned today. That's where we're going. <laughs> That's where we're going. So you can worship the earth if you want to. Nope. Nope, 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 guys. God's going to take, take care of the earth. He's going to renovate it. He's going to get it ready for his son. 
But in the midst of that, he's going to destroy all the ungodly with it. We don't want to be anywhere with these guys. Aren't you happy, Roscoe, we're going to be with him? Yes, Lord. I, I don't know about you guys. Every time I read this book, I am so happy that I know I'm going to be with him, man. I don't care what God do to my grass. I can care less. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here for any of this, man. I don't want to see no mountains coming out. I, I, I love me some good seafood, but I don't love it that much. They, they, they can have the catfish. They can have all the, all this stuff. I, I don't need it. <laughs> Tell them, man, you're not going to care about your grill. You ain't going to care about none of that stuff. You want to make sure you out of here. You are gone. You are with Jesus Christ. And how do you do that? Simple, guys. Put faith and trust in him right now. Live for him. Obey him. Get your heart out of this world. Get your heart out. Why would you put your heart in the world that's going to be destroyed? Why? Go get out of this thing, man. It's, it's not important. It's not important. Nothing is important. Nothing is important but Jesus Christ and your relationship with him. And that's what you need to be focused in on right now. Amen. Join with us on Wednesday as we continue to talk about the issues of social justice. So please join with us on Wednesday in that discussion. And come back with us on next Sunday as well as we continue to walk through the book of Revelation. And, 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 and just on next Sunday, we'll just probably only be able to deal with the fifth trumpet because it's such a long set of verses that talks about what's going to take place at that time. So please uh, uh, like us on Facebook uh, uh, as well. Uh, YouTube, Eternal Purpose Fellowship, and visit us on the World Wide Web, eternalpurposefellowship.com. We'll see you again. God bless.